Welcome to the video lecture series, Culture, Worldview, and Origins. We're Tim and Holly Nyquist. This is the, the history of two cultures. And this is video lecture series number five, five out of eight. Um, where we've ended up on the previous one is the, the non-Western, the non-Western culture of the Hebrew nation being disobedient to their God, being disobedient and not maintaining a cultural purity they were conquered, they were deported. And so there was a, a, a very special point in history around 600 BC where the Hebrew nation uh, for their unbelief and for their impurity uh, and not keeping their culture pure nor keeping the, the worship of God and nor keeping the sabbatical years, they were deported around 600, uh, 597. At the same time, there was the birth over the seas or uh, in Ionia, Ionia of um, the philosophy, Greek philosophy of naturalism, of discarding the authority, discarding revelation, discarding um, uh, just anything that had to do with tradition and, and outside. And so what they were focusing on as their reliable source of knowledge was their own thinking was humanistic, humanism. And that was <clears throat> being developed to take the place of what had existed in whole, the whole rest of the, the Eastern world of, of being dominated by a spiritual force of, of some kind. But um, the, the Hebrew nation served 70 years of exile because they did not obey the Sabbath, the sabbatical, of, of giving their land rest every seven years. But after 70 years, they were, they were given permission to go back. They went back and they rebuilt. They rebuilt their temple, rebuilt their city, and they began again as the conservative culture, as the Hebrew culture, which in and of itself is, is, a, is a miracle in that a culture can, can refound itself on its same land and practicing its, its same worship, its same uh, monetary agriculture and, and, and everything like this, that, that is quite remarkable to have a, a culture um, being born again on the same territory that they had once occupied. And so what we have now is, is the, the, the Greek culture is becoming stronger. The Greek culture is now permeating. The Greek culture has now built um, strength to be able to go out and expand its influence. What we have now is the Greek empire. Not just a Greek culture, but now it's an empire under Alexander the Great. In the years around 300 and, uh, 330, 340 B.C., um, Alexander um, takes over from his father. His father uh, dies, and Alexander, at 20 years of age, takes on the, the military um, conquest that his father had started. He had a military machine that was amassed, and, and uh, Alexander the Great just took the machine and just went forward with it, completing what his father had purposed. And in 332 BC, Alexander the Great uh, comes around through Macedon, down through Sidonia, down through Phoenicia, and conquers Egypt, 332 BC. Then he goes from there and up and over down into Babylon and conquers Babylon, who had been the reign, who had been the, the, the reigning kingdom at that time because Babylon had conquered Judah, had conquered Jerusalem and deported them to Babylon. But since then, Babylon or, or Jerusalem has been reestablished and now comes through the Greek army. And uh, what is the Greek army doing? The Greek army is doing something different, though, than what the Babylonians did. Alexander the Great, during his campaigns, Alexander was always intent on finding out everything he could about the areas through which he passed. 
he took with him an entourage of scientists to record and analyze this information from botany, biology, zoology, and meteorology to topography. His desire to learn and to have information recorded as scientifically as possible probably stemmed from Aristotle's teaching and enthusiasm. This is from Ian Wor uh, Worthington commenting on Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great was not just a military force. He was an academic force. <clears throat> he took with him an entourage of scientists to study, to study the, the land, the people, and the culture of which he was conquering. Now, why was he doing that? <clears throat> he was doing that because they were beginning the process of what was called Hellenization. And what's Hellenization? Uh, what's that have to do with Greek or what's that have to do with Western? Hellenization comes from the term Hella, which was the term for, for Greece. So what they were doing was they were Hellenizing in their path. Now, what, what, is, what is Hellenizing? Well, the Hellenization process. Alexander's tutor was the Greek philosopher Aristotle. Okay, so what was Alexander being tutored in? Greek philosophy, Greek naturalism who impressed upon him the value of Greek culture and philosophy. As Alexander campaigned, he spread Greek thought and culture in his wake, thus Hellenizing, which means to make Greek in culture and civilization, those he conquered. Alexander the Great understood that to conquer a nation, you had to conquer its culture. Because even though the Hebrew nation had been conquered and deported, it returned and it flourished and it controlled again the area, its area, as a Hebrew culture. And they did so because they knew that previously their forefathers did not protect and conserve the culture, therefore they were deported. Thus, those that came back from exile promised and made, we are going to keep our culture. We are going to obey the commandments. We are going to practice the sabbaticals. We are going to honor our God and our king. Their God, who was their king. So now that they've been flourishing for approximately 200 years, after they've been exiled and returned back, now comes the Greek army through. And the Greek army now is coming to Jerusalem. Now what happens? Well, this is the interface, the first of many between the Western culture and the non-Western culture of the Hebrews. What happens? Well, here it is, Alexander the Great meets God's high priest. Just to give what is not recorded right here or written down, the high priest um, is the intermediary between the, the people, the Hebrew people, and their God. He is the one that goes into the temple, into the Holy of Holies once a year, to offer sacrifices and sprinkle the blood for his sin and for the sin of his people. And so he is the, the major authority. He is God's authority in within Jerusalem. He has a dream. They know the Greeks are coming. They know Alexander the Great is coming. And what instruction does God give them? God tells the high priest, I want you to go out. I want you to go out and meet this king, Alexander the Great. I want you to take your priests with you. And they're kind of like, you want us to do what? And so that's what they did. They said, we don't know why. We don't know what's going to happen. 
but we're just going to be obedient because we've been disobedient before and we were deported. We're going to be obedient now and, and see what happens because, again, we're on the verge of being conquered. We're on the verge of being decimated, deported. But God says, go out. So they go out the city. They, the gates are open. That is not the protocol when you're doing it when there's an attacking army that's coming. It's to shut the gates. They open the gates and they go out to meet this entourage that's coming towards them. And they know that he's coming to conquer. And what happens? Alexander the Great, they meet on a hill that's, that's called Prospect Hill that has a a view of Jerusalem and the temple. And when they come, they come face to face. And I can imagine what the high priest is thinking. He's not armed. All he's got is his, his, his robe and his, his, what he's dressed in as, as high priest. Something shocking happens. Alexander the Great dismounts, comes to the high priest and bows. And acknowledges that they are worthy to be recognized. Then the high priest, probably in shock, turns around with his Levitical priests. They turn around and go back into the city with the whole entourage of, of Alexander the Great's generals following him. And they go into the temple, do a sacrifice, have a feast, and then is, is reported that Alexander asks, what can I do for you? And the high priest asks, we want to maintain our culture. We want to maintain our purity. We want to maintain our sabbaticals. And we want to be exempt on those sabbaticals from paying tribute. And Alexander the Great says, okay agreed upon. And then Alexander says, I have established and am establishing uh, different centers of study. And there's a center of study that's being, that has been established in Alexandria, Egypt, or that's being, because he's just conquered, he's establishing a center there of Alexandria. And it's going to be an academic center. And the Jews are welcome. And the Jews will be given Greek status to be able to study within those centers. But what are those centers going to teach? They're going to teach uh, Greek philosophy. So even though he gives privilege to the Jews to maintain their culture and their cultural purity, he invites them to his study center for those that willingly want to come and, in fact, to become Hellenized. As they're leaving, his generals, or his, one of his leaders, comes up to him and says, What is this all about? I have never seen you bow before anybody. You come as God. You come as, as the reigning king of this whole region that has conquered. And Alexander's response is, I did not bow before him but before that God who has honored him with the high priesthood. For I saw this very person in a dream and in this very apparel. This is what is recorded uh, in the Talmud and by Josephus. It is not recorded in other secular sources or, or Greek sources. And the reason I would think being is that it can't be explained. It can't be explained through natural processes. Something happened here that was quite extraordinary. But what they do recognize is that the Jews were accorded special privileges that other cultures and other kingdoms were not. And the Jews attribute that to the fact that God sent the high priest out to meet Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great had already been prepared by God in a dream to accept. So in other words, if 
the Jews had the commitment to preserve their cultural purity at the cost of their own lives, then God was going to give them in their own lives back to continue with that cultural separation. Very important was the cultural separation. But very interesting was at the same time, Alexander the Great realized that military strength only conquers for a time, but Hellenization will conquer for eternity, will just change their whole mind and perception of the world. And if he can Hellenize them, he has conquered them for forever. So that is Alexander the Great. He was really a, a brilliant man, not just militarily, but in conquering through strength and strategy, but also through the conversion of the culture and of the mind. After Alexander's death, which happened within a few years or a year or two of him conquering Babylon. He died in Babylon at the age of 32. Um, he had no, no family, no children. He had no um, explicit way of what to do with his kingdom, who was to step in his place. And so after Alexander's death, his empire was divided among his four generals. And there were skirmishes. Now there was war between the generals, between war. And that was almost the beginning of, of the end of, of the, the Greek Empire. Um, but one of his generals, Lysimachus, in 306 BC, he took Thrace and much of Asia Minor, and he made Ephesus his capital city. Have you heard of Ephesus before? Ephesus was the place where Heraclitus was born and wrote about the Logos. Well, now we have Ephesus being the capital city of one of the four generals that has divided the empire. And Ephesus now becomes such an important city, it is, it, it is growing now as a trade center. And because of that, it is not only a trade center of commercial commodities, it is now a trade center of Hellenization, of thinking of, of, com, of continuing the conquering process and of maintaining the control of people's minds through conversion of Hellenization, through Greek philosophy. So that is what we have. That is Ephesus. We have now the Greek culture that has surrounded <coughs> the Hebrew nation. But the Hebrew nation is still granted liberty to practice its culture, its maintain its culture as well as it can, although it is surrounded by Greek influence. That influence continued building, building until there was <coughs> the translation of now the Hebrew scriptures into the Greek language. And that was ordered by Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, around the year 287 BC. So Alexander the Great came through around 330 BC, and then approximately 40 years later, the Old Testament, well, the Hebrew scriptures that only existed in the Old Testament, the Torah, was translated into Greek, into the Greek language. So in other words, there was now enough contact and enough intermixing between the two cultures that the Greek culture now wanted the Hebrew scriptures in Greek. Who were they that wanted the scriptures? Well, it was the king. The king wanted it translated, but it was probably that there was now a number of Jews that were being born and that were growing up in Alexandria, Egypt, because they had scholarships to go study. They would be studying now uh, under the Hellenization process, and, but they wanted their scriptures. They wanted these scriptures. So the Greeks wanted the scriptures also. 
So now we have Hebrew scriptures that were written from a Hebrew culture that are being translated into Greek and being read by the Greek culture. And what, what's very important is that to understand the original intent and meaning of a writings that is written in a culture, you have to interpret it through that culture and by those cultural values. But if you take those same scripture, translate them into another language, and then use a Greek culture to interpret them, you're going to come up with different belief system, different things of, of understanding what those cultures or what that to have meant, what the, what the scriptures meant or what they were to have meant. Now there's another quote here, and it's about the Hellenization process. And just to remember that the Hellenization process happened most in, in education, in formal education. And where formal education was most prevalent was in the city centers. And so this is a quote uh, from another historian that says, it must be remembered, however, that for the majority of people in the Middle East, or in the, the near, the middle, and the far east, the farmers in the countryside, Hellenistic civilization remained an exotic foreign plant. Greek language and culture was mostly confined to the cities. Rural populations retained their traditional ways of life, along with their native languages and cultures. This is very important and interesting because when I began teaching in South America in Spanish, I did fairly well in a, public, in a, in a private university. I did not have problems communicating concepts. I did not have problems um, teaching and them learning. I went to another institution that was not pub private. It was a public university. And right away, I had problems. And I did not understand what was going on or why was there a problem until I realized that most of the students that I had at the public university were from rural areas. And so they had not been Hellenized. They weren't Westernized. And I had been, I was Westerner, teaching as a Westerner to Westerners. And that's why in the, the private university were people that had income that were professionals from the city, and I could teach, and it went fairly, fairly well, I believe. But when I went to the public institution that served uh, rural areas more, I struggled uh, because I didn't understand. I didn't understand that rural um, students have a different way of processing, different way of thinking, different way of learning. And uh, that is what this paragraph is, is actually saying, is that it must be remembered, however, that for the majority of the people in the Middle East, the farmers in the countryside, Hellenistic Western civilization, remained an exotic foreign plant. Greek language culture and most, was mostly confined to the cities. Rural populations retained their traditional ways of life, along with their native languages and cultures. And I would say it's the same thing today, is that the Western educational model works fairly well in the city settings with city Hellenized students. When we incorporate students that are from the rural areas, they're un-Hellenized, un-Westernized, non-Western, they're gonna struggle in a, in a Western institution. And uh, that is what this gentleman here, this historian, is mentioning, is that not everybody was Hellenized, not everybody was Westernized. It was the city centers. The, the same thing I, I think we could say for today. That wraps up on this section. We're on the history of two cultures, uh, number five, lecture series number five. We still have, we're, we're going to eight, so we have six, seven, and eight to go. 
I, I hope you're, you're still following, you're still with me. We're Tim and Holly Nyquist, and uh, we just, if you want to communicate or can communicate, these are the addresses, and uh, hope to see you in, in, the, in the next next lecture series. Thank you.